and I'm going to turn it over to Panos. Uh, Panos is a former student uh, at Harvard, and now he's a professor at the University School of Business at Chicago, happens to be one of my outstanding students. So Panos, welcome, and thank you for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you. I think you're going to tell us about a couple of new things that you've been working on to control uh, errors. Okay, yes, hi. Um, thanks for the, for the kind invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm also humbled uh, to be in the presence of such uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So Edo, uh, be prepared to be uh, disappointed. <laughs> so um, uh, today I'm talking about um, a new uh, method, a new approach to doing inference. It relies on uh, the randomization framework uh, first developed by, um, it, 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 it does originate in features work, but it, it, it was uh, formalized by Liman and Romano. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my setting is pretty simple. Uh, it's, the it is the standard regression model. We have Y through the responses, X's are the covariates. Uh, better are the uh, model parameters, uh, and epsilons are going to be our errors. Uh, this little Omicron that you see over there, that's, uh, that's kind of an error in translation. That's, this will be epsilon. Um, so the betas are going to be the, uh, the, our object of inference. We'd like to do inference here, but our key uh, departure from the classical uh, frameworks, uh, the classical approaches, is that we're not putting any assumptions yet. And uh, part of the uh, proposal in this, in this work is that we just don't rush into making these assumptions so that we try to make uh, inference, uh, to develop an, a, an, a mode of inference that is as flexible as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So just a review of those standard approaches. Of course, there's the parametric approach. Uh, we just have a model for this epsilon. We derive some estimators, let's say ULS. We do some mathematical statistics, CLT, uh, and then uh, we, we say so we can use these asymptotics to, uh, to do inference. Or we can do booster, which is a non-parametric approach. Uh, we can either, and there are two variants of that, we can either resample this in the entire rows of our data, that's the pairs to booster up, or uh, and, and less well-known, but actually better in practice is to uh, booster flavor is when you fix the x's, the, the covariates, and then you resample the residuals. And that was pioneered by the, uh, uh, the work, the pivotal work by Friedman and Lane. Um, however, both approaches uh, require some form of sensibility. In many cases, in most analysis, you have assumptions about IIDness, some assumptions about the X's, uh, and both of them cannot handle easily complex error structure. And this is, this, this is at, the, at the core of this proposal uh, today, is to try to address the more uh, errors that are, or like problems, data that have a more, uh, in, more, more interesting, more complex structure than just plain IID or plain extensibility even. Uh, so uh, both methods rely on, on approximations, they do rely on asymptotics, and, and in many, most cases they do rely on well-behaved estimators. Uh, so the proposal I'm going to uh, discuss today um, might work, can work even under uh, ill-behaved estimators, even inconsistent estimators uh, for that matter. Uh, next so, slide, please. So am I saying that something is wrong with Bootstrap? No, nothing, there's nothing per se, right? This is the most uh, important, one of the most important statistical tools. Um, however, the, um, the main critique that I'm developing here is that it, it was based, it was introduced as, it, it was, it, since inception, it was based on uniform sampling. So um, when you try to accommodate, to address complex set of structures, you need extensive modifications. Uh, so that's why we have so many flavors of bootstrap. We have residual, wild, cluster, block, stationary, pigeonhole, multiplier, Poisson. It's just a whole uh, zoo of different bootstrap uh, uh, flavors. So, uh, and I think the, and that's my uh, philosophical take, let's say, uh, is that the booster starts with a procedure, right? It starts with this resampling. We start, it, starts, it, it starts with what you have to do with your data and then, start, and then goes ahead to accommodate your particular problem structure. And my argument is that it should be the other way around. First, we have to think about what the structure of the problem is and then think about what procedure to use. Uh, and uh, in, in some sense, bootstrap has always been this, um, this heavy, uh, hammer in, in search of nails, right? And sometimes we have to duct tape a screwdriver around it. So um, next slide, please. So what I mean by when I say complex set of structures, well, in practice, uh, we do have complex dependencies, okay? So, uh, and we do require, and most methods require some form of invariance assumptions on these errors, even, even, even implicitly. In most cases, it's, these, these assumptions are implicit. Um, some form, of, what, what do I mean by invariance? Well, uh, I, when we assume that the errors are, are ID normal, that's, that's already an invariance assumption that, you're, we're, that we are making. Uh, but not, that's not as primitive as assuming, let's say that the, the data are extensible, like the errors are extensible. 
um, which can happen when you have when the errors are being generated under identical conditions, for instance. Uh, the errors might not be extensible, but that might be sign symmetric or they might be clustered. Uh, suppose, for instance, you get observations from different firms um, uh, and they might be clustered, your data might be clustered by firm, or the, the, the data might be clustered by, uh, by the geography. Uh, you might have a time dependence, that's an autocorrelation structure, uh, or they might have double clustering or triple clustering. Suppose you have uh, panel data where the, these are clustered by the firm, by time, by geography, et cetera. So there's all sorts of invariances, all sorts of structures that can appear. And um, unfortunately, right now we need a new method, a different method for each one of these different structures. So my promise here, or at least the promise of this approach will be that uh, it's to develop a unified way uh, to, um, uh, to address all these heterogeneous uh, settings. Uh, next slide, please. So how, uh, what, what is the proposal here? What are, are we going to do? First of all, it will be just a, a, a different way of thinking. Like first of all, we'll try to think about what in various assumptions uh, are, mat are matching with our problem structure. So before we even begin thinking about the procedure, first we have to de define what is the error invariance that we're going to base our inference on. Uh, for that matter, we're going to assume that there's a group of transformations G uh, where your errors, if you apply some these transformations on your errors, your errors are distributionally equivalent. It, it doesn't uh, invariant. It doesn't, they don't, they don't, the distribution doesn't change uh, for any uh, transformation from that, from that group. Uh, for instance, exchangeability is something that uh, Emmanuel mentioned uh, before, is, is basically you kind of shuffle your data, you, you shuffle your errors, uh, and the distribution doesn't change. Um, and these are assumptions, these are, this is a more primitive assumption than, as, than assuming IID. It's like a weaker assumption, right? Uh, or when you're assuming normality, you're assuming exchangeability, but your IID normality, you're, you're assuming exchangeability, but you're also assuming sign symmetry and other sorts of more primitive uh, invariances in your data. Um, so in this case, this uh, in this in, in the in going back to that extensibility, in this case, this G, this capital G, script G in the original slides, uh, is basically the symmetric group. And this, the algebraic structure, uh, the fact that this is an algebraic group is important uh, for the validity of the methods going forward. Now, this G can be anything, right? It can have some weird structure. It can be, it can, it can have like time dependencies. You can have cluster dependencies, double cluster dependencies, etc. So in this case, naive bootstrapping cannot be long, longer work, right? You cannot go ahead and just start permuting data uh, and, and, and accept and, and, ex, and, and expecting that this is going to work. And that's not a failure of the bootstrap. It's just a, it's, it's more like, I think, um, a failure of, uh, of our understanding that uh, it, it's really the problem structure that matters. And it's, it's not a question of what procedure to use. Um, going forward, this G, I would call it inferential primitive because uh, this will be the important uh, object that will basically inform the, the, the inference. Um, uh, going forward, the, the, the idea will be that uh, the, the analyst is going to define what is the inferential primitive for, for the particular problem, and then more or less the, the, uh, the procedure will be defined after that, it will be determined after that decision. So this is the promise of unifying all these different, um, uh, it, all these different settings under like a common inferential framework. So uh, next slide, please. So the general idea is as follows. Uh, and this will be an infeasible, uh, an idealized procedure, but I will make it concrete in the next slide. So suppose we have, again, this regression model. We're not making an assumption, an assumption about the errors. I'm not assuming that they're normal. I'm not assuming they're IID, but I'm assuming that they do satisfy that, um, uh, that invariance, okay? In that with, with G being the inferential primitive. And suppose we have some hypothesis to test on the beta. Um, later, it will be a linear hypothesis, but let's keep it general for now. Um, there are two key components to, to the idea here. One is to have a test statistic such that under the null hypothesis, uh, your test statistic is a, is a, is a non-function of the errors of your regression. So that's, that's the first uh, thing. And that's, this is not so, uh, such a strict of a requirement. Um, uh, in, a, in, in, my, in most of my implementations, this, uh, this test statistic is basically the OLS, it's based on OLS. So you can, based on classical OLS theory, you can just show that this, this condition can, uh, uh, can, can, can be satisfied easily. Now, suppose now that you can take that function, this T of N, and you can just take these errors and apply those transformations at random. Uh, let's call this capital T. Uh, and then uh, in, the second, in the second component, the second part of that, of that method, just calculate the, T the, the, sorry, the P value uh, using that uh, capital T uh, with respect to whatever you observed in data, like the observed value you tested this. Thing. Now, standard normalization theory by Lehman Romano suggests that this p-value is exact for testing the null. Uh, 
uh, and the, the proof is, is, is very straightforward. You can show that whatever the randomization uh, statistic you have over there, this, this capital T has the same distribution as your test statistic, just, just which follows from the invariance uh, property that we have already assumed. Um, the, the, the group property of, of this G is also important, and that's part of this. Uh, just to keep things simple. And I should say that at this point, that randomization theory is, is maybe it, it maybe is a misnomer. It doesn't have a good PR. Uh, it, 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 this, when, we, when, we, when we say randomization theory, randomization test, this does not require a, an actual randomized experiment. Uh, it's the, at the heart of that theory is really the invariances, the group invariances, and, and not the actual act of randomization. Uh, but it, it kind of comes from Fisher. Uh, it was developed according to that, to that language. So uh, it's called randomization theory right now. And actually, conformal inference is, 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 is an extension of the, uh, or is part of the randomization uh, framework as well. Um, uh, okay, so next slide, please. So here's a concrete example. As I, I said, this is an infeasible method. It's using the, the actual errors, but these are unobserved. So what can we do in practice? Well, suppose we want to test a, a very kind of simple significance test on the, on the jth component of your unknown uh, parameter. Suppose we want to test that beta j is equal to zero. What do we do? Well, first of all, assume that beta j is equal to zero, solve the restricted LS, and get your restricted residuals. So the idea will be basically just plug in those restricted residuals in the in the in the uh, procedure that I mentioned before. Your test statistic, uh, how to satisfy that condition on the test statistic? Well, just take the regular OLS. Uh, standard theory will tell you that under the null hypothesis, uh, this is a known function of your errors, and that that p n function you can see it over there. It's a classical uh, projection on the on the the standard projection on the on the column space of X's. Uh, so, that, so that condition satisfied, great. And then we just plug in those restricted residuals and we calculate the p-value out of that. And so uh, our, our decision for the null hypothesis for the significance test is basically depends on that, on that p-value. It's as simple as that, okay? It just relies on simple, uh, on simple OLS and, re and restricted OLS uh, calculations. And this, uh, you have to, to, to make that assumption of the, of the error invariances. Uh, just a just a quick note about the theory. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to show to kind of show you what is the promise in terms of the of the, of the theory. What what do we um, what 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 is this method uh, is doing better? Like why do why do I think that this method is going to be more robust than other approaches? Well, the main condition for the validity of this test. Uh, by validity, I mean that just controlling the uh, the level of the test uh, under the null is that um, this condition uh, in, in equation one. So if this condition in equation one holds, then the test is, uh, is asymptotically valid. Now this condition has three weird terms, but I can give you the intuitions behind them. I can show you why I believe this, uh, this, this type of approach will be more robust and, 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 and hopefully will kind of open up new, new um, ways to do inference. Um, so uh, this term two is actually uh, is, is a term that 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 quantifies the richness, if you will, of that of this set of invariances. Um, so um, this the the inference will break the, the, the proposal that I, uh, my proposal here will break. For instance, if your if your trans these transformations you're, you're making are not rich enough, let's say that instead of permuting n elements, you just only just permuting only two of them as n increases. Of course, you don't have too many permutations involved, so it's not a, it's, it, this, this set is not rich enough. This, this richness is not uh, uh, a, a formal term, but it just kind of shows you that the, the type of uh, transformations you're making, that complexity, it does affect the, uh, the, the validity, like the, the, the extent of your, of your inference. This term three over there that you can see is basically, you can think of it as um, your, your, your transformations Preserving the information structure. This um, uh, this inverse. You, you probably recognize the feature information there in that in that expression term term three. So uh, intuitively, kind of uh, the, the all these things together, they kind of tell you that uh, your 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 estimator, which is term one, uh, your the, your richness of the of the transformation you're making your 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 information primitive, and the and how this this or how this relates to the information structure of your problem. All of this have to interact in a, in a uh, synergize so that you get that asymptotic validity. Uh, the, I think the, the important, uh, another important point here is that this term one doesn't have to go to zero. So basically this method can work even with inconsistent estimators, uh, even with ill-behaved estimators. Uh, so for instance, suppose that your errors, uh, you, the variance of your errors increase with n, it can happen, right? Like the more data points you collect, perhaps the, the more 
uh, the more noise uh, is being introduced. In this case, the OLS is not squared consistent, squared and consistent. It might be uh, not even n um, um, consistent, right? So it, it doesn't matter. Well, the important thing is key here is it doesn't matter whether it doesn't matter to uh, that you have a consistent estimator. What matters is that synergy uh, between all those elements, your estimator and your inferential primitive. Okay. Um, next slide, please. And the next one uh, uh, for for the rest of these. Uh, um, presentation will be mostly examples and if I illustrate to you uh, the, the the logic behind this and uh, what I think is um, uh, is kind of new and novel and useful about it uh, suppose we have clustered error suppose we have a very simple regression model like like the, like the one on the head over there in this display um, the axes are just simple just from zero to one uh, and the uh, the errors are uh, are clustered so there are two clusters one cluster the the error the variance is very small when x is your your covariance is like less than 0.9 and, and above that threshold the, the variance is much larger so in this case of course the data are not uh, exchangeable like your your errors are not exchangeable uh they are exchangeable within clusters though and that's the, the key uh, structure that we can we, we can utilize but if you do just run naive or less uh then you will see that we just fail to detect significance and not only that the uh this this uh this interval is tilted to the wrong direction um, and uh, now, but in this case, the uh, the structure is obvious, right? We have we can have extensibility within clusters. So uh, if if we had that knowledge, then we can just apply that method, this residual randomization method, where instead of just doing uh, this resampling of of the residuals kind of uniformly, we only do this resampling within the the the, act, the particular clusters. Okay. So next slide, please. So if you do that, uh, if you just define your Z, your inferential primitive, as permutations within those clusters, then you can test uh, your uh, you can test your significance. Uh, you, you can have your um, you can implement your significance test. And not only that, uh, you can you can you can run a test for any value of your slope. As you can see, that you can for for different values of that beta in this null hypothesis, we can we can create we can generate uh, a p-value. And this is the so-called p-value plot where uh, you can cut it horizontally. At like 0.025 or like 0.5, depending on what is your uh, targeted significance, and then whatever remains, what's what's below that plot, will be your confidence interval. This is called test test inversion, uh, and it can give you. We can we can use that method to you know, invert it to get confidence intervals as well. So in this case, the confidence intervals that comes from this more uh, with this uh, using this type of resampling that's more adapted to the problem structure gives us a, a confidence interval that's 0 0.03, 0 0.025. It's not exactly centered at the true value, which here is 0 0.2, but it's, it is close and it's definitely better than the regular OLS, of course, okay? And the reason, of course, is this it's, it should be no surprise. We're just utilizing the structure that is inherent in this problem. Uh, next slide, please. Here's another structure that might be more useful for uh, financial applications. Suppose you have autocorrelated errors. Um, suppose that the errors in this case uh, is might, might have an IR structure, but might even be non-stationary. So what can you do? Well, there are several robust error uh, methods for that. There are hack methods, heteroscedasticity, autocorrelation, persistent methods in the literature. There's also the block and stationary bootstrap methods that are available. Um, however, all of them, uh, both of them are not robust to, to strong dependence, like to, to kind of strong uh, autocorrelations. Uh, they don't work very well in small samples and also very, very sensitive to your, uh, to your covariates as well. If your covariates have um, uh, notoriously, they, if, notoriously, if, you do, if they don't have, if, you, if they have heavy tails, then uh, these methods are not going to, to perform that well. So, what can we do here? What type of invariance can we exploit here in that in that in that type of problem? Well, uh, there is one. Uh, if you look into, if we stare a little bit into that autocorrelation structure, just one type of invariance uh, can, comes forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, with that simple model, then what we can say is that. Uh, if we condition on some epsilon being zero, then what comes what comes next is going to be sine symmetric, okay? And that follows immediately from the this AR structure essentially, okay? So the idea here will be that well, let's define an entirely new inferential primitive where uh, we're going to look into a residual plot like that. And instead of just resampling like what naive bootstrap is doing, we're going to do this reflection around the the time axis. And why can we do that? Is because we are assuming that the structure of the, of the errors have, have this particular AR uh, form, okay? Uh, and so the idea here is basically to say, it's it, it essentially to say that this, so that the, this G, this inferential primitive are basically just uh, reflections uh, 
around the time axis, and then this type of um, 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 in, in, in transformations in our residuals will give us, uh, will basically we'll just plug it in, into our, in our procedure and will give us uh, in our uh, inference. Um, so, uh, and by the way, this, this, type of, this type of trick, this type of procedure can be applied even with errors that are non-stationary, which we don't have uh, good methods right now for, for that even. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just one example of how uh, this method works. I have, a, the, I have the errors, they have a simple, uh, autocorrelation structure. Uh, I, 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 I look into uh, um, errors that have uh, that have like normal innovations, even like a mixture innovations. I look into cases where we have covariates that are IID, that are autocorrelated, and also that they have thin tails, they have heavy tails. And there's just too much happening here. I cannot point your attention. I don't have the uh, pointer. So let me just say that the um, the, the, um, the reflection test, this randomization, this residual randomization method, it, it, it is robust across all these different domains. Uh, and it, it, it is because, first of all, we're conditioning on the X's, so the, the heavy tails of, the, of this covariance is not a problem. And second of all, we're just using that, that, that AR structure uh, correctly, right? We're just adapting to the, to the problem structure. Whereas if you look at OLS, of course, it's going to, uh, to break because it doesn't work under those, those, uh, uh, those um, under the settings. But also the hack errors are, are quite uh, sensitive to whatever errors, distribution, er, distributional er, uh, distribution of the errors you have, and also um, the the whatever, whenever you have thin tailed uh, you have thin tailed covariates or you have heavy tailed covariates, you can see that the um, uh, it does it, it it does go that diverts a lot beyond this point of 0.05, um, which is the nominal coverage. Okay, so just a, one final example. Next slide, please. Just a, a cherry on top. Suppose we're seeing that in very new, an entirely new application. Suppose we have data with uh, I is going to be firm, time is, uh, um, is, is basically a time, and we do have uh, just a very simple kind of a panel, uh, like a panel uh, data model. And we do have X's that are, have an autocorrelation structure, and they also have log normal errors, which are heavy tailed. Uh, suppose we have errors that, that are, they do have this autocorrelation structure, but they also have random firm effects, and they also have normal errors. So what are we going to do now? It's, it's a very complex model. There's a very complex structure. What method are we going to apply? Are we going to use uh, bootstrap? Are we going to use block bootstrap, hack errors? Are we going to do uh, Fama Macbeth errors? Well, just try to adapt to the, to the invariances in your, in your problem. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, actually, what you can do here is if you, uh, one observation is that if you demean uh, over, over time your errors, now this has this have the autocorrelation structure that I presented earlier. So just use the reflection uh, invariance that I, this G ref that I presented uh, in the previous slide. So that's one. Okay. So so in our in our resampling, what we could do, we could just take the residuals, average over time, uh, subtract for the actual residuals, and then do this reflection test. That's one idea. If the innovations in the random firm effects are extensible, uh, then we can actually also exchange the the rows. Of this of this uh, residual matrix. Okay, so both of these can 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 uh, can work, uh, assuming that the uh, under the assumptions, of course, of the of the of, of correct invariance. Here's simple simple sim simulated study: five firms, 200 data points, uh, strong uh, autocorrelation, and suppose these firm effects are uh, are t with uh, five degrees of freedom. Or less breaks, of course. Uh, if you do a simple hack uh, version where you just average over firms and then you do uh, hack robust errors. Uh, it, it is better, but still um, very much over rejecting. Uh, the, the correct level here is 5%. And if you look into the residual randomization method based on these invariances that I presented earlier, uh, you can actually get to, these are all of the valid. And the one flavor that's the, the, the this, what I call conditional is actually very close to the nominal level as well. I don't have time to describe the difference between a conditional and conditional, but I do have that in the paper if you're interested. Uh, and the code for this particular example, just you can download it, you can play with it, just um, load it and just run the main simulation. You'll see uh, how, this, um, how this, this, this exactly works in practice. Okay, so uh, next slide. and. That concludes for me. Uh, I talked about residual randomization, uh, which uh, the, uh, the, the main uh, promise here is that it is going to address inference in regression models uh, with complex error structure, be it uh, one clustering, double clustering, autocorrelation structures. Um, if you look into 
the, the idea is that you look into what what invariance, what problems, what what kind of structure uh, might make sense in your problem, and then you kind of take that and then you plug it in into your in this residual normalization procedure, and in in that sense, it addresses inference with this complex set of structures in a unified way. Okay, so instead of starting with the procedure and then thinking about the structure, we start with the structure and then uh, thinking about the procedure, which I think it's it's more it's it's a better um, it's a better approach. Uh, so uh, and uh, if you look into the paper, there are like extensive uh, uh, comparisons to several flavors of bootstrap, several flavors of robust error methods. Uh, so the, the same, the, what, what I think is a notable feature of this approach is that the same exact procedure is being applied to widely different settings with clustering, double clustering, uh, autocorrelation, uh, et cetera, uh, and even high dimensional regression as well. Um, so uh, for each one of these settings, there's a, there's a different method out there. Uh, so we have to develop a different method where, where, where here, uh, in contrast, uh, this type of approach gives you the same procedure for all those different settings. So. Uh, hopefully you can see some value in it, can, can, can try it out, uh, and perhaps it, it opens up uh, like a new mode of inference that's, uh, that's more flexible. Uh, next slide, and that's it. So if you're interested, these are uh, some, these are the, there's some more information. Uh, I have uh, a working paper, there's, uh, there's an R package called RRI, there's a technical report uh, that kind of walks you through that package, and uh, uh, there's um, um, a link there for, if, you, if you're interested more in that. Uh, and uh, the, um, and I should, repeat as well that that, that example with the um, uh, this uh, panel data structure uh, you can find in that link uh, on that slide so thanks for your attention I hope it didn't go uh, over time you know? but thanks again thank you Panos can confirm we did not disappoint uh, very <laughs> good job <laughs>